Oh yeah, let's do that then. So I am doing a webinar, and this is the webinar. Who knew what a webinar was, but now we know. And we're talking <laughs> to India, Sweden. I feel like the Eurovision. Hello, Sweden. Hello, yes. Bangalore. <laughs> Hello, 12 points. So we're just waiting for one more. Oh, ah, Radhika is here. Hi. Hi. Hi, guys. Hi, yeah. How are you doing? Good. How are you guys? Good, good. So nice. Oh, you've got a mobile. Look at that. You're moving around. That's very flat. No, actually, I just picked up my computer and walked across <laughs> the room. I'm very strong. You haven't decided on your background yet. No, I figured it out. It's just that I left my door open and I did not wish to be disturbed. I'm going to get attacked by my two dogs in the middle of this webinar, I know, but... <laughs> That's okay. That's yeah. fine. They're funnier than me, I... so it's okay. There you go. Looks like we have a lot of people on already waiting for us to get started. So I'm just going to go through the customary bits before I turn my PowerPoint off. And then you only have our faces up there. Uh, welcome, everyone. I see about 30 people online. I'm Kaveri Singhji from Culture Rings, and I welcome you to today's webinar. Uh, the theme is laughter and the importance of it during the COVID-19 crisis. Um, just to go through the basic guidelines. This event is being recorded and people who are unable to attend right now will be able to view it later with the link that we share. Everyone who's logged in as an attendee has been muted. So panelists, you will not be disturbed and mobbed. Um, and those who have questions or comments will use the Q&A function that they see on Zoom. Um, now I'm gonna switch this off, stop share, and we're going to get started. Um, so the COVID-19 pandemic is spreading fear and panic like wildfire. There's absolutely nothing funny about it and we wanna acknowledge that. And this is an unprecedented crisis. We are in India's biggest lockdown, centralized lockdown since the Indus Valley civilization 3,500 years ago. And it's killed my sense of humor. Um, I Googled jokes just to see if I find anything funny at all. And the first one that popped up started something like, one day there was an Englishman, a Swede and an Indian. And there it was. I didn't need to read the rest. I knew what I had to do. And here we are bringing you the funniest Englishman I know, the Brit, Dom Jolly, who according to my research is spending his lockdown time curating a sad songs playlist to help people get through the dark time. Hi Dom, do you want to say hello to our viewers? Hi. Hi, Cavalry. Hello, viewers. How are you? I am. I'm curating a, uh, just in case you weren't depressed enough, because I'm an ex-Goth, uh, a playlist of sad songs. Sad songs make me happy. I'm sorry. It's just me. And then we have uh, Radhika Vaz, my favorite Indian comedian, also my school friend from, what, 25, 30 years ago? Surely uh, not. <laughs> She's also made people's bellies hurt a lot, a lot out of laughter in America, where she lived for a while. And uh, right, she's right now in lockdown in India's capital city, New Delhi. Radhika. Hi, guys. I'm, I'm actually technically not in Delhi. I'm in Gurgaon. And people who live in Delhi will be horrified if they think that you think that Gurgaon and Delhi are the same thing. Yeah, we South, Indian think, we all, South Indians think everything around Delhi, including Punjab. It's Delhi. Yeah, <laughs> it is. And then we have, uh, not the least, um, my funniest Swedish friend, the hilarious Karin Adelskold. Did I say that right, Karin? No, not at all. Oh, okay. <laughs> Karin Adelskold. <laughs> it's hard. <laughs> from Sweden, who is recovering from the dreaded coronavirus herself right now. But oh my God, oh. true to the Viking in her, it's no big deal. She's here anyway. Karin. Hi, nice to meet you guys. You should have seen me a week ago. I was not this happy or clean or um, standing up at all. So I'm wow. just so happy, so happy to be back. Oh my God. Uh, by the way, I just want to say I'm wearing my Swedish dress. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Thank you. And my British underwear, Dom, but uh, my Swedish <laughs> dress basically. Uh, a friend of mine uh, is, uh, is Swedish and her daughter stayed at my uh, apartment while I was in here and they're irresponsible 19 year olds and one of them forgot her dress. And so now it's my dress. Yes, of course. And, and I love it. 
So I'm wearing Swedish underpants just to fill this out. Beyond board, round it off. Obviously, what else? <laughs> <laughs> I never leave home without Beyond Borg. <laughs> That's wonderful. So maybe let, let's find out. Um, uh, so each of our guests from, from their respective country, let's find out what is the air like? Maybe we start with India. Radhika, can you tell us what is the scene like from your point of view, your unique point of view? Okay, so I, I mean, I'm currently in the north of India, which has had the worst air quality in, in many years, the worst air quality. And about three or four nights, maybe a week ago, my niece called me. And she said, just go out onto the, the balcony and look up. You're going to see stars. It was so exciting that we could actually see stars in the sky because there's, you know, there's no traffic on the roads. There's no sort of addition. There's no unnecessary pollution of people just driving around or unnecessary pollution for that matter. So in that way, it's kind of crazy that we've got the best air pollution, but now we're not allowed to leave the house. So not the best air pollution, the least air pollution, the best air pollution. You sound like Donald Trump. We have the best air pollution. We have the best air pollution. Yeah, we have the best pollution in the world. <laughs> best garbage. Dom, uh, congratulations on getting your prime minister back from ICU. It wasn't me, I'll be honest with you. I had nothing to do with that. <laughs> I, I, I will take that. Yeah, I mean, there's a big, uh, as usual, uh, as Brits, we're just grumbling really about everything. So uh, firstly, there's a big conspiracy theory that Boris wasn't, I mean, not only are we so incompetent, I mean, how Trump hasn't caught coronavirus and yet our entire cabinet has caught it and has left us with a man in charge that I wouldn't put in charge of, of my car. I mean, really, Dominic Raab. But uh, there's a big theory going, there's a conspiracy theory. Firstly, there's the big conspiracy theory that 5G is responsible for all of this. I don't know if you guys have got this, but here it's crazy. It's the new flat earth theory and tin full hat wearers all think that 5G is basically responsible for it and that this is all an excuse. Someone else told me today that uh, there's a guy called David Icke is a famous conspiracy theorist and said the whole point of this coronavirus is so that someone can put new batteries in all the birds. I mean, it's, it's really gone crazy. But uh, the big theory, the conspiracy theory is that, uh, is that Boris didn't actually get coronavirus uh, because apparently he recovered too quickly. And now we're grumbling that when he left hospital, instead of going to number 10 Downing Street, he went to Chequers, which is his holiday home. So apparently he's breaking lockdown rules. I mean, we are just, we're a sad nation. We really are. And Karin, I mean, let me ask you first, how are you? I mean, you seem to be recovering from what, what is obviously the coronavirus. Uh, and yes, I haven't, been, I haven't been tested, but I had all the symptoms and I've never been as sick as I was. It was terrible. Uh, but it, it got, it was kind of fast, although I've been uh, uh, sick for two weeks. I have many friends that have been sick for a month and I'm happy because I wasn't that. Mm -hmm. I think I didn't have to go to hospital. But in Sweden, main our government had recommended us, uh, it's just a recommendation to stay at home. Uh -huh. um, so the big discussion in Sweden is, are we Swedes really, really smart or really, really stupid? Uh, and we don't have the answer yet because we really don't know. Because you don't have a lockdown, do you, as much as anyone else? No. So it's a lot of people, it's a lot of people staying at home. Uh, we are people that are following recommendations. And then, you know, Swedes, we are kind of strange, isolated anyway. We don't talk to people. So we have it in our <laughs> culture. But then again, um, a lot of people just don't care about recommendation. And, and this weekend, when it was an Easter holiday, people were out partying in Stockholm. So, yeah, we don't know yet. Is this the way to go? Or is it the way you just did, like you do, lock down everything? We haven't done that yet. How do people react? Because in Britain, we've all become mini policemen. I mean, there are literally people looking out the window and timing. We're supposed to allow, we're allowed half an hour a day exercise. And we have people going, my neighbor just walked his dog for 32 minutes. And yeah, we're, but we we're have walking that. on them. I mean, they've become social distance Nazis. Yeah, yeah, we've got that in India too. So I have a friend who has like a smoker's cough, like a really bad, he calls it a dragon oh, no. cough. And so he was just coughing in his apartment 
and somebody complained about him. What a and neighbor? I, yeah, like somebody, uh, like a neighbor, basically heard him coughing in his apartment like really loudly and complained to the whoever. And the next thing you know, like a health official and a cop and whatnot were outside his door, knocking and being like, "Look, uh, we just got a complaint that there was coughing from this apartment," and. <laughs> He was so like, we, I had this we come to catch like, it. <laughs> yeah, great. we've come to take you away, basically. Yeah. So, yeah, definitely. I mean, I live in a really big building complex, like maybe, I want to say like three, four hundred flats. So it's five or six buildings, but three, four hundred flats. So it's a lot of, a lot of people in, in very close quarters. And I can see why people are getting nervous and paranoid. Like, I, I get it. I, I haven't reached that stage yet. So I'm not freaking out if I see somebody who's, casually not really wearing like level orange alert mask or whatever but you know someone just casually got like a kerchief tied around their face i'm like okay whatever but there are people who are like they're not wearing masks and it's not exactly three meters between us and there's definitely that we've got joggers problems joggers are becoming very very unpopular here in the uk because joggers seem to feel they relate if they're jogging together they feel their relationship will be over if they don't jog right next to each other. Mm -hmm. and, and some joggers are fine, but most of them, they just plow straight on. So everyone, they don't do any social distancing. Then you have that kind of post-jogger sweat plow. <laughs> hits you. Yeah. It's just not good at the moment. Joggers are becoming very unpopular. Like a jet stream, joggers jet stream. That's it, jet stream, yeah. exactly what it's called, JJS. Yeah. 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 Sorry? It's a problem in Stockholm as well, yeah. Karin, what would you say is the big shock factor in Sweden? Like, if I look at India, we're going through a lot of really tough stuff, you know, like, I don't have a cook to make my morning tea. I don't have a driver to take me to the grocery store. How are you surviving? I don't have a cleaning lady who comes to clean my house. So we are going through some really uh, very, very tough changes in our life. Now, what is, really what is the difference tough. in Sweden? Oh, the biggest is Sweden? What will that be? I what think like uh, the difference now, uh -huh. it's not really, it's not, I think that social distancing, I think that's a Swedish thing. I think that's not as good. much Swedish as ABBA. Abba. We, yeah, I don't think, of course, we have to stay at home more, but we're always at home. We don't, I mean, we don't socialize that much actually. And also we don't, I mean, we don't go up to people and say what we think. Uh, not even now if we get really really mad we say it on Facebook I do see if we should uh, like get closer to the subject I think that I, I didn't know that Swedish people were so funny that they obviously are because I mean the humor has exploded in social media in Sweden I mean I think Swedish people are quite serious we don't joke about ourselves but amazing thing can happen when people are just staying at home being isolated obviously i think it's a big change actually in sweden do you think the rest of us from from other parts of the world would get the humor that you're thinking is funny in sweden uh, do you think dom I or think radhika so. yes i do think so i think <laughs> but i think maybe in sweden we we are not we don't have that culture like you have in britain uh, to joke about ourselves and the situation when it's really bad, not as much as you have. And um, I've been working with this for many years, trying to get people to joke more about in, in uh, I mean, especially in bad times, to get through bad times. Uh, so the things that I see now, I haven't seen that before. And that makes me happy <laughs> and sad, but mostly happy. One, one of the, the things I've seen online that really define different nationalities and the way they deal with humor is, you know, when Italy started doing the singing out of the windows to everyone, and everyone in Italy was beautiful opera and everyone was applauding. And then there was a French guy who was doing the accordion and everyone was dancing with their own members of the family. And then we had British guys singing terrible songs out the window and all their neighbors telling them to shut up. And that kind of, that's yeah. us as Brits. We just, yeah, we're, we're, uh, but as Brits, we're like the Swedes, really. We, we don't yeah, read the like... Yeah, Swedish one person. Yeah, yeah. Hello, Brits like come on. We don't like yeah. talking... We don't really like talking to strangers or meeting people, so the social distancing is perfect for us. I mean, it's great. It gives yeah. you an excuse not to say hello. And the only time we speak... I go out with my dogs every day, and other people go out with their dogs, because it's the only thing you're allowed to do. And we feel, because this terrible thing's going on, that we should 
talk to each other, but we don't really want to. So we stay five meters away, which is great. And then we discuss <laughs> each other's dogs, but we don't talk about each other. So we go, how is the dog? How's he dealing with it? But we never mention the person. And that's about as close as we get in England. Radhika? Um, I mean, you're right. I, it's embarrassing, but I think uh, this whole, you know, the only people who are missing their fucking cooks and their maids and what, I mean, it's the, this typical, you know, sort of like what you call a first world problem in India. And they're like, oh, I'm so tired. I have to do so much housework, whatever. But, you know, outside of that, I personally think that well, we are having a hard time with social distancing because we can't bear the thought of not being able to like see whoever we want, whenever we want. Uh, I think, I mean, right now it's funny because I'm in Gurgaon where my husband's entire family lives. And normally I would see all of them multiple times in a week. And now none of us can see each other. And I think everyone's kind of relieved, frankly, like the whole family is like, oh good, we don't have to see each other, but no one's saying it, but we're all feeling it. They're like, this is normal. We shouldn't be seeing each other that much anyway. We all probably get along much better after this isolation thing has been lifted than, than we did before. But I'm yeah, I think it's definitely... Say that? I'm seeing people more than usual. We're doing these Zoom things every day. I, I know. I avoid my computer. It's, like... <laughs> it's true, actually. I mean, it's funny how I, st I kind of... I don't, I, I don't have the, the hottest social life to start with because, you know, comedians, mm -hmm. we always end up going to open mics or whatever. Like, that's kind of our lives, right, in the evenings. So for me, my social life was going to open mics a few times a week and then I'm not really in the mood to see anybody other than that. But now all of a sudden that's gone. And so I'm doing these phone calls with my friends and it's funny because I'm the one like leaving the first time. I'm like, guys, I'm sleepy, I gotta go off. I, the new, the I new thing is now. the excuse for leaving a Zoom. You go, listen, it's been really great. Yeah. Uh, uh, but I've, I've got to go and sit in the other room. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's terrible. What do you say? What do you say? I just say I'm, I'm sleepy now. I'm, I'm, I'm sleepy. Oh, and I'm using the housework. The, the, it's everyone's being so sympathetic in India, in my socio-economic group, that you know all I have to say is, guys, I've been, I've been cooking and cleaning. I have to go now, and they're like, oh, go, 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 go. So even if I haven't, even if I haven't lifted a fucking finger for like three days, I'm like, that's my excuse. I hope they're not watching because now they'll know. But yeah, basically. <laughs> They made this experiment last weekend to try to do a stand-up yeah, club night, but on Zoom with no audience, which is oh really, really hard. I mean, that is our uh, fuel, you know, to do stand-up without audience is like, yeah, I don't know. To have That's your panic dream. Out. Yeah, what, yeah? That's your anxiety dream, really. I, I don't know. So, uh, or corporate show I mean, where they're almost like they're not there. A corporate, drunk corporate show, yeah. A corporate show where it's, it's, uh, they might as well not be in the room. But it's interesting, I just spoke to a friend of mine actually, who's a comedian, she just did a corporate show on Zoom. Oh, and I she and I were just, Yeah, and she and I were just laughing because she said, the, it's weird obviously because they have to mute the phone, I mean, they have to mute themselves. And so you're doing the show, like Karen pointed out, to no sound at all, like not even, not, and I said, yeah, but don't you feel like that's how most of our corporate shows kind of go? You'll have like maybe one or two people who give a shit and then nobody else does. So yeah, in that way, maybe those shows will continue. I don't know. But you're right. It's weird. Like how, how do we go to the next level of stand up if this carries on for months? I don't know. Well, we don't. Stand up is, is, is I mean, stand up relies on audience, doesn't it? So it does completely. <laughs> I think what's interesting yes. is stand-ups, because I don't do stand-up, I do more TV and, and visual stuff. So for me, yeah. this is better for me, because I'm, I'm still making stuff yeah. that I can put out. But what's interesting is seeing stand-ups trying to adapt and adapting very well to doing video stuff and, and trying to think, well, how do I make my funny stuff? But I've got mm -hmm. to make, because normally you don't have to worry about the visual, you just get on the stage and do it. That's the joy yeah. of stand-up, grab a mic, it's done, whether I died or lived. Exactly, yeah. This, you put up there and then it sits there forever and you realize the nightmare we have, like the worst thing you've done just sits there. <laughs> and Dom, so then I guess the conspiracy theory could be 5G yeah. and you. Yeah, I mean huh? 5G, 5G is, uh, is massive here. I was going to do a 5G conspiracy, I was actually going to do a conspiracy theory webinar where everyone had to wear tinfoil hats and we could do stuff. <laughs> but 
to be honest, talking to these people is so insane. I had to do a bus ride in Newfoundland. We went to, we went to one of the four, if you believe that the earth is flat, which if you do, then you're mental anyway. But if you do, there are four corners of the flat earth. And one of them is in a place called Fogo in Newfoundland. So I went there to Fogo, one of the corners of the earth with five flat earthers. And we got in a boat and I said, well, look, this is it really. <laughs> we're gonna go. And if you're right, we're gonna fall off the edge of the world. And if, and if we're not, you can go back to your job in Nando's or wherever you work. And they refused to accept it. We just went out in this boat and they kept saying, it'll come. And I'd go, guys, we've been going three hours in this boat. I mean, it's insane. So that sort oh, of stuff we can't really do anymore, but maybe we can, uh, you know, work, work something on it. Maybe Karin, you can, you can help us understand, you know, the statistics that I was looking at. Uh, in the UK, people going into ICU with coronavirus, there's a 50% fall rate. But in Sweden, if you go into ICU with coronavirus, there's only a 20% fall. 80% people come back, come out alive. What do you mean fall? You mean death rate? Yeah. It's not 50% in England going to ICU. It can't be. Is it? No, if they go into ICU with coronavirus right now, it's 50. Oh, thanks for telling me. Great. <laughs> first time. <laughs> it's not in Sweden, it's <laughs> what is it? Is it the Viking blood? Is it the new sense of humor, the wave of Swedish humor that's coming? I have no idea. And I think that in Sweden, we don't measure the thing the ways that you do. I think it's so, I, I, can't, I can't say. Death really. rates Maybe. come differently, I think, in different places. But one yeah. of the things that really is big in England at the moment is people using that term, like saying Viking blood to fight it. Really? it kind of, you can't fight this thing. It's like saying someone's brave when they fight cancer. It's a terrible thing because it means someone that gets really badly ill, it looks like somehow they're being cowardly or they're something. They're a wimp, they're, exactly. They're, they're a wimp. Yeah. Like, you can't fight this thing. This thing is like a natural selection. It's a, it's a terrible, like Darwinian thing. It hits you, you know, luckily Karen seems to have survived, but she could have got something. It's crazy, that's the terror of it. I know, I'm an asshole. I shouldn't survive five minutes, but. <laughs> All assholes survive. I mean, we tend to survive, <laughs> sadly. <laughs> so Radhika, how do you think people, especially I'm thinking of the Indian context here, um, how do you think people are going to come out of their dark caves at the end of this, considering there are no beauty salons and most of us don't know how to pick our own eyebrows? How what do you think? Oh my God. Uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm afraid. I'm afraid to look at what everyone's going to look like at the end of this. No, but I was just thinking that I, I actually feel Indians are quite self-sufficient. Like, I feel my generation, we did all our own beauty stuff i clearly as you can tell don't do a lot but uh, you know most of my friends know what what to do and and i feel like we are a pretty self sufficient bunch of chicks so i have a feeling that's not going to be a problem i did see something recently where somebody said that hair dye is going to be the next toilet paper i, I didn't make that up but i just saw that that hair dye is going to be the next toilet paper because now people are like Fine, it's been like 3 weeks and the roots are out now and it's like uh, it's too much to deal with. So um, there is a very fun. Uh, it's a lovely hashtag on Instagram that are Corona haircut. Uh, people cutting themselves and cutting their children's or their husbands and giving yeah because they can't go anywhere and it's hilarious because obviously we're not all hairdressers. No, and I, I'm sure Dom and I will agree. Uh, I mean, Dom might might sympathize with me here, but that. People with short hair, we have to have far more frequent haircuts. You know what I'm saying? Like, I feel like Karen and, and Harry, you guys could go another inch or two longer. And it's like, it'll be the same more or less, right? Whereas for him and me, if it's another inch, it starts, it's like, it starts to get really unpleasant for us to look at. It's not even what other people have to deal with. So I actually feel like... I'm going to use my husband's beard trimmer, you know, which just seems like a safe way to do this and just set it to a number three setting and just, just go for it at I, some point. I didn't, more think be, yeah. I didn't think we'd all be talking about cosmetic stuff. It seems to be the biggest problem. It is the most important thing. Of the, of the lockdown, especially in India. I don't know how you guys are doing it without your cooks and your cosmetic, uh, without your cleaners and your, I mean, yeah. how, how are you surviving? Uh, I got the very, I, but having said that, I'm thinking how ridiculous this was. The very last thing I did before I went to lockdown was I slipped out and got a haircut. So, you know, yeah, I literally, I was an hour before the lockdown came in, 
I got my hair cut. I thought, what am I doing? And I thought, I'm probably in there for a long time. And I've seen hermits come out of caves. So I want to give myself the best, the best push. Yeah, that's what we're going to look like. Hermits okay. coming out of caves. That's good. <laughs> so, uh, we have a few questions that have already come in. I thought maybe it's nice to address them along the way. So one is from Maya, who, who uh, lives in Bangalore. She's from Europe, but she lives in Bangalore. Um, she's asking, how do you suggest people keep up the mood and ensure that they keep laughing? Are there funny channels? Are there things that we can do uh, for ourselves that, that can keep up our sense of humor? I think the most, imp the most important thing is to uh, remember how important it is. Um, like it, it is it is essential to have fun in, in isolation. You cannot forget, forget that. I think people are just, some of them are just sitting waiting for things to be fun, but you need to look for them. So just go out on social media, for example, try to find things that you like or things that you know that you used to like before. It could be YouTube channels, it could be anything. I'm, for myself, I'm watching uh, Jimmy Kimmel, his live show, he's doing it from home. It's wonderful, uh, Saturday Night Live, it's doing specials also from home, which is, it's excellent. But it's just, it's just so important to laugh now. Right. You know one thing, oh, go ahead, go ahead, Dom. Go on, Radhika. No, 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 go. Well, I was just saying, I grew up in Lebanon uh, in a civil war. And uh, in the middle of a war, you kind of feel that comedy is not going to be important. But actually, my experience of visiting places from North Korea, I've been to all sorts of weird places, Iran, the darker the situation, the more, the co more comedy actually exists. You sort of feel that comedy disappears. But actually, comedy is such a coping mechanism. And it is a way of dispelling anxiety. And I think sometimes people are a bit worried about being inappropriate, about making jokes about lockdown, about corona. Are they being insensitive? And I think that's wrong. I think black, dark comedy is, is it's a real way of expressing anxiety, of actually making yourself feel better about stuff. And I think people are worried. They go, oh, is that a bit tasteless? It's not. Like, we all laugh about things still, whatever. And I don't think people should be embarrassed about it. One of my favorite things to do, it might be if you live near neighbors, is there's this whole thing at the moment, there was a very sweet one where someone put up, there was a cat sitting in someone's window opposite their house. So someone put up a sign saying, what is the name of your cat? And then the neighbor put up a thing saying his name is Basil. And then they had a chat, but then that's really moved on. And some guy said he was in a house and there was an old house opposite. And he put a sign up for his neighbors saying, what is the name of the eight year old, the pale eight year old Tudor boy that lives in your, in your loft that keeps waving at me, basically insinuating they had a ghost, which was great. <laughs> so messages to your neighbors, that would be really good. <laughs> I, I feel like, yeah, it's true. I mean, there's definitely the, the concern about being inappropriate, but I think that's not a coronavirus issue. That's all the time. So anytime there's been a disaster, people like all of us are worried that unless we experience it ourselves, we're sometimes a little bit afraid to say something because it, it could be. But this is something we're all experiencing, actually. Um, and so, you know, definitely WhatsApp groups have popped off. The least likely people are forwarding so many jokes. I mean, this, in fact, like almost too much sometimes, I feel. But something Karen said, which is to even go back and look at stuff that you used to find funny, because now I feel like I have all this time. There's no pressure really to... I don't really have anywhere to go or do anything. And so I'm looking at old books that I used to find funny or that I read in the, like David Sedaris is like a favorite of mine. He's just kind of funny and low key. And then I have a whole bunch of like the old Adrian Mole. Uh, I'm just reading Adrian Mole right now, like rereading it. It's like, I just, I know randomly, like I have these books from way back when I haven't read them in ages. And I was just looking through my stuff and I pulled out all these books and I'm like, oh, I can read these three books short so you know just stuff from back in the day that made me laugh then and yeah it'd be fun to look at now the one thing though that i did which i regret is i found a whole bunch of photographs from from boarding school when i knew kaveri from like that age to right through my 20s my 30s and now I'm 47, so a few of this decade as well. And I was like initially thinking, oh my God, this is awesome. I'm going to Instagram fucking post a whole bunch of throwbacks and this is so nice. And then I started looking at how young I looked 
<laughs> and how <laughs> much <laughs> like, has fucking passed me by. And I'm like, oh my God, this is the worst. And I just put them all back in the drawer and I'm like, I'm not looking at those. I don't, I don't have the bandwidth for that kind of depression right now. Yeah. yeah. There's a, there's a flip side to that, right? The happy turns sad very quickly. Very quickly. Yeah. So I wanted to share with you, um, you know, because I feel like, like you've pointed out, Dom, that uh, it, uh, the darkest times sometimes bring humor out of the most unexpected corners. And I've noticed that the, the people to really pick up and start getting funny during this time have been the police departments of various states. Uh, like within the first three or four days, a bunch of videos went viral. And I want to share with you what the Bangalore police created. Okay. Um, and then one second, just figure this out. This is very high tech. Yeah. Here yeah. we go. Look at that. <laughs> yeah. So this is, uh, you see it, right? Yeah. But do we press play or do you? No, no, I press play, but I just want to show you where they are right now. They <laughs> are at, uh, because you've all been to Bangalore. La Radhika, you've lived here. Karin and Dom, I've been your tour guide here in Bangalore. Uh, very good, I've you passed, were too. We passed this by. This is Mahatma Gandhi Road, MG Road. You know, all, every big city oh, has- Oh yeah, Trinity Road. Church. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Trinity Church, exactly. And these are the cops here, uh, giving an awareness. Uh, so you can see on this side, uh, you can see a lot more cops. So they have their own audience as well. <laughs> This guy's dressed as a coronavirus. Just in some mood there. Oh, yeah. Was this what it felt like for you, Karen? Did you see the, one of these? Yeah, exactly. Happened? Like the one in the red. Yeah. yeah. yeah that's you share a motorbike with one of these guys? I mean, they're not, social, they're not social distancing, are they, to be honest? No, but if you have corona, you don't have to, you can, you know, hang out with other coronas. I well, guess. this guy definitely has corona now, and they seem to have stolen his motorbike. I'm not quite so sure. What he's yet. blowing is a conch. Yeah. That's actually a war cry. Oh, is it? Yeah, so that's actually the Indian war cry. A um, conch? I thought that was Lord of the Flies. <laughs> yeah, so, so I, I thought I'll get, I'll, I'll try and first get Radhika, since, uh, um, I mean, she's a uh, sister to these guys, uh, same native country. You can I, am, I am literally the sister to these guys. Okay, first of all, that those the helmets are were crazy. They look like retro shower hats, like from the seventies. That that's hilarious. I I'm almost tempted to say I would find that a lot funnier if they hadn't been touching up that guy so much because I like Karen said they definitely have coronavirus now. Um, <laughs> You know, I think the, the police have a particularly painful role to play because like where I am right now, they are at, because I live very close to the main, like to a national highway. And so there's a lot of connecting roads and they are stopping a lot of cars and asking people, where are you going? Why do you have, you know, like it has to be a really, uh, like an essential sort of items trip or whatever. And, and people are rude to them. People are rude to the police in India because we feel very entitled if we speak English fluently and, and have some money that we think we don't have to talk properly to the police at all. There's no fear at all at, at a certain level, especially I feel people who own their own cars or whatever. So they definitely have a tough job to do. But I feel like the Bangalore police are doing, doing their best. And those guys are, you know, theater geeks who accidentally got into the police force. This is their moment. And uh, Dom, maybe I can ask you, uh, I mean, we've learned humor from the British, you know, so maybe you can tell us what you think. I apologize for that. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I, I mean, it's funny in a way, because in a sense, the whole point of that video was to raise awareness. Now, I said to you yesterday when you showed me that, uh, well, we're all watching it. I mean, that thing went around the world. So in a sense, humor worked for that, because I mean, why that you're not going to watch a Bangalore policeman giving you a very strict talking. It's what Karen teaches, I think, you know, it's humor as communication and all that kind of stuff and it works. But the difference, the difficulty is, I mean, I think you're laughing at rather than with, with them, but who cares really? I mean, the message gets across, so possibly, I don't know who got that, who got the message, but uh, it's very weird. Someone's just asked me on this, have I got a virtual background? No, this is my library. You know. <laughs> 
It's, ah. like, it's, my, it's my wall of heroes. Thank you, Colin. They're also asking you why you don't have a customary rock, lockdown beard. Can you see that? Uh, yeah. Why do I have a beard? Why don't you have a lockdown, lockdown beard? Lockdown beard? Yeah. Because I shave. <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I mean, I haven't gone totally caveman. <laughs> I can do the questions. I have a thing called electric razor and uh, I just use it every morning. It's incredible. <laughs> and Karin, what, what did you think about that video? I mean, obviously it's an effort. And um, I think Karin uh, strongly agrees that humor can be taught. So after- We had an argument about it yesterday. Yeah, we had an argument, which was a good argument. In our pre-chat. <laughs> it was a really argument. argument. It was, uh, I know what's right and, and you didn't. So Yeah, um, I, I felt so, uh, I got it right, definitely. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, just keep on thinking that. Um, okay. I think, uh, just as Don said, I think in Sweden, that's not really our kind of humor. Uh, I think it's, but we laughed maybe at you guys or at the guys with the, with the helmets. But as you said, anything is good. And especially now when we have to trust the police and the government and if they can try to be funny, not all the time, maybe, maybe sometimes it's good. I mean, as I said, we need to laugh and it's, it's not just um, to get perspective on the whole very serious. I mean, it's a pandemic. I mean, it is a crisis, world crisis. It's a way to survive this just mentally, but also actually physically, it's so good to laugh because it, it releases um, endorphins. And it's, I mean, when I was really sick now, I could not move at all. The only thing that I could do was just laugh uh, at things, not at myself, obviously, but it actually, it's like a tiny, tiniest workout, but it's still, it's something, you know? Um, I don't know, Karen, if you, when I was in Mumbai, I went to laughter yoga, which is not something I've ever done before. Are you aware of that? So we don't need to teach yeah. the Indians this. It was the most, uh, as a Brit who just doesn't want to get involved, it was just the most mm -hmm. awful moment of my life. But it, it was incredible. They're like forcing themselves to laugh. And it is, it's like a workout. Yeah. It's terrible. Uh, I've tried it too, and you like tickle each other, and it's it's crazy. Yeah, yeah, I really don't like it, but yeah, it's good for the body, obviously. I think it's a very British Swedish thing. We don't like being told when to have a good time. It needs to be no. sort of natural. It's like yeah. <laughs> I, I also think with the laughter yoga, I've never been to a laughter yoga class, and again, I I, I, I understand what they're trying to do, but I don't see myself doing it. But at the same time, the thing I was thinking about laughter, it's one of those things where sometimes if you make yourself laugh, I don't know whether it's a nervous reaction or what happens, but suddenly it can suddenly become like a natural thing. So I think that's how the, the, the laughter yoga also goes on that, mm -hmm. that premise is that, because you know, sometimes when you're in a club or in a movie theater or whatever, and somebody laughs, yeah. It doesn't have to be, you may not have thought it was the funniest fucking thing, but if somebody laughs, it can yeah. sort of catch on and be a ripple effect a little bit, you know? Almost like a virus. Yeah, we have a person, both in England and Sweden, instead of like laugh yoga, we drink alcohol. It's almost yeah. the same. Yeah. Well, alcohol is the only way that we can either kiss people, hug people, or have sex with them. It's the only way we get close to it. <laughs> to me, when, we went to, when I went to the Mumbai yoga thing, it felt like being in the exercise yard of a mental ward. It was insane. I mean, literally, it was very disturbing. It still like, hits me in anxiety dreams. It's like, my, I mean, my dream is to have a room of people laughing with me, but it just, they weren't even laughing at anything. It was very disturbing. That's the thing, they're not laughing at anything, which I find. But, but again, like, I just feel like there's a, the theory behind it is that once you can get that muscular reaction going, it releases all the shit that Karen's talking about, the endorphins and the, blah, 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 and the blood it flowing doesn't. and the bugs. I just it felt shame that. and sadness, you but just, that's not my life. <laughs> <laughs> You're just uncomfortable and like, oh, yeah. I, hate I just this. don't like to see people happy, which is why I'm very much enjoying the pandemic, I'll be honest with you. That's true. So okay. uh, another question that somebody has for Dom here is what inspired the music choices for your playlist? Uh, well, I mean, Cavery found my playlist and uh, which is on my, it's on Spotify. It's called Songs to Get Us Through This Shit. And uh, I kind of actually, the very first song I put on 
actually re I realized was quite relevant, but it wasn't. It was just a song I'm really listening to at the moment I love called Do Not Let Your Spirit Wane by this amazing band called The Gang of Youths. And then I realized that everyone was like, oh my God, this is really sad, these songs. I just all my songs are sad. What can I say? I'm a goth. Like all the songs I used in Trigger Happy were sad songs. And Cavalry came on and did what Channel 4 did when I gave my show in. They were like, why is all this sad music on this? We should have cartoon music. But I think sadness, joking aside, I mean, I am a goth. I love sad music and it actually makes me happy. But I think sadness and comedy, laughter and tragedy, all that stuff, they're very linked. I mean, they're, you know, right on the edge and often, I mean, when we were talking, when I was talking to Karen about whether you could teach comedy, you know, I'm not denying you can teach comedy or get in touch with comedy, but uh, to me, to have real funny, weird, inspired moments, I think you have to pay for it on the other side. I think you have to have sort of, I think you have to live on extremes, really. And I think people that live quite centered, sensible lives, they're probably a lot happier, but they don't touch on those moments. And I, I just feel that to get really great moments, you have to have very bad moments. This has gone very deep, but so, so yeah, I think sadness and comedy are, people are always like, but you're a comedian. How come all these songs are so sad? To me, they're very, very similar things as emotions. That's I remember I started with stand-up. Uh, I started when I was really, really depressed and ended up in a stand-up com comedy um, course. It's 12 years ago. And uh, I thought, I mean, I'm so sad. I can't be a comedian. But my teacher told me that you, the, the more shit you have in your life, the, sad, the more sad you are, the more humor can you make. Yeah. And because humor is all about contrasts and surprises. And so you can't, you can't even have humor without really serious um, subject. Or it, it has to be, and you can't, if it's not serious, it can't be fun. If it's not fun, it can't be serious. So that's why I think also we see this much humor right now because it's we're in such a serious situation. But all and we see that every time. All, lots of art comes from moments like this. I mean, it's terrible, yeah. but when you look at wars and when you look at situations, uh, artists go in, you know, artists are quite insular anyway. It's why a lot of it happens in very cold countries. You know, they get, they dig in in Iceland for six months and they come out with a great album or whatever. I think it is a great creative time. I mean, actually, yeah, yeah. although writing is very difficult. I have to say, I'm writing a book at the moment. I thought everyone keeps going, oh, this will be amazing. You'll be, you know, the great time for you can sit at home. I just can't. I, it's not right. Uh, right. We need to do silly stuff, not deep stuff. Yeah, 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 totally agree. But, you know, I was just thinking about this laughter business and, and how it, you know, something sort of to what Karen and Dom just said was ages ago, like long ago when I was much younger. I, I broke... I also like sad music because I find it very cathartic and uh, I only like happy music like if I'm dancing or whatever but other than that I like sad music because I generally find it cathartic and even if the tempo is kind of upbeat like the lyrics have to be like angsty and angry and sad and then I kind of that's the stuff I like but I have to say that when I was like maybe 18 or 19 or whatever I had this big breakup with this boyfriend and I sat in my room in my dorm and I was listening to like really sad, like lame songs. And I specifically remember leaving on a jet plane by John Denver. And, wow, I, you were and I was like, ah! and a friend of mine came into the room and she was like, what happened? And I looked at her and I was about to tell her that I'm really sad. And that's why I'm listening to sad music. And because it made no sense, we both started laughing. And I remember that moment was that I was so upset and so unhappy. And then when I was asked to explain what I was doing, it just became so funny for both of us because I should have been listening to happy music. What, but what but are you I'm listening just... to? Dancing Queen? I mean, come on. Yeah, exactly. I could not have done no. that. No, that means you've got no. no soul then. It means it wasn't real if you don't do that. You've got to go through the process. In a way, I think your, uh, your, your playlist will actually help people, you know, expunge that from their systems. Yeah, they'll think, Jesus, there's nothing more depressing than that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Radhika, I mean, yeah. uh, just coming back to India again, you know, one of the things that I've noticed, and like you were saying, somebody complained, somebody ratted on a neighbor who was coughing. I've heard a lot less, like in the morning when I used to wake up, because there's a shaft around in our building, there's a shaft around which all the bathrooms are. Yeah. And I normally try to get up as early as possible, so I don't need to hear the mm -hmm. clearing of the throat and the spitting of the phlegm every morning. Yeah. But somehow I'm hearing a lot less of that these because days. Because they're probably afraid that someone's going to call the cops on them. And I, I mean, you guys have been to India, so you know how much we like. We can't, 
we can't swallow a fucking spit. Like it's just not a thing we like to do. It's like, ah, and then we just, it has to be. And I'm still seeing that, which is the most amazing thing. Like I have, I take a walk every day outside the uh, enclosure that our buildings are in down a street. And I do that because there are all these stray dogs that have been sort of, uh, you know, there's nobody to feed them anymore because they used to be fed by all the office going people and all the little uh, uh, chai shops and whatnot that used to just give them scraps. So there are a lot of them there and a lot of people from the buildings are feeding them. So I take a walk. I don't have dogs. So I'm kind of just using that as an excuse to also go out and just hang. And you every time you walk stray dogs. Yeah, I'm like, I'm feeding the stray dogs with my yeah. mask on. Uh, right. and, and, and somehow they're letting me do it. So uh, I'm doing it. And I go every day. And every fucking day, every day, there's some asshole who clears his throat and then spits on the road and then puts his mask back on. I'm like, why are we still doing that? So I think that, you know, in the building, they're probably afraid to, like, clear their lungs to the same degree that they used to. Also, I mean, this whole habit, you know, when I hold cross-culture training workshops, which is the other thing that I do apart from tours, um, one of the first five questions that's asked to me is, why do Indian men hold hands when they're walking down the street? Is that friends? They're all homosexual. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, a, it's just a done thing. So we have a big problem with PDA. So if I have a fiance here, uh, going down the road, he can't turn around and just, you know, kiss me or, you know, hold my hand when my family is around. But you, can, so that would be awkward. you can do it in general. I'm not talking about during Corona. In general, you can do that with somebody of the same sex with whom you have no sexual relationship. So you can walk down the road with... Supposedly, yeah. yeah. With Whatever. Her. Because there yeah. are no homosexuals in India, I imagine. No. <laughs> All that's going to stop. How do you think we're going to survive that? But that's the thing, like you were asking these guys what, what's changed and both of them admitted that they come from cultures where everyone's like, eh, actually, we're fine. We don't need this fucking socializing. Indians, on the other hand, like we can't keep our hands off each other clearly. So I, I think we're having a very hard time. I mean, definitely. In Sweden, all the dating apps has totally exploded the last month, like Tinder. And do you have Tinder in India? Yeah, 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 we do. And I have some friends who are on Tinder, but, but tell me your story. Yeah, it's. But they can't uh, it's, meet up. What What are they doing? Are they having? No, uh, like they have ads saying "Don't meet." You can have a Zoom date. Um, oh really? I haven't tried that. I haven't tried that yet, but um, they like every other picture. It comes up like "Date on Zoom, please." Um, I have no happy ending you. there, presumably. Oh no, I, I have a friend who was, uh, she called me, so she tells she's single and she tells me all her Tinder stories because obviously I'm. I'm happily married and I have none. So uh, she was telling me about how because of uh, the coronavirus now, there's a lot of, uh, a lot more uh, sexting. And uh, so she said, you know, I never did much sexting at all before uh, because she's like, you know, whatever the fuck, I'm 47 and I just, you know, just meet me and we'll see if it works. Otherwise, I'm not into this texting business. She's just not. So, uh, but she said that now because of Corona, she has to be. So she was sexting with this guy and he was so bad at it. And she's like, maybe I should incorporate the sexting into my real, like once this whole thing ends, because it's a good way to weed them out. What was the term of grammar, the spelling? I think he was just not very imaginative. I like your tits, D-I-T-Z. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just new at, at this uh, texting thing and, and this uh, date app date in thing and it's so hard it's just like yeah, yeah. It's like say, say something really dirty like what do you say your bathroom i mean it's, yeah. it's really hard are you to... on tinder karen yeah well this might be the time to tell us your, yeah. what's your do you so go by your I'm real a, name or have you got a bit of an I'm alter ego from sweden virus free i zoom and uh, i have different backgrounds when i'm at nice. home do you have a boudoir background and stuff? <laughs> I'm going for the intellectual. I have a boudoir background. I have a yeah, special uh, on the beach for like mm -hmm. so. For special uh, time. <laughs> oh, that's terrible. That's amazing. I'm actually on the buy and sell uh, thing. We have specialist uh, uh, dating apps here. I mean, obviously, I'm not talking specialist, but not just Tinder. So I have friends who are very posh, and they don't want to meet anyone. So they have things called, for instance, muddy boots which is a kind of hint that they all have big 
stately country homes. So you kind of know that so there's muddy boots yeah. and then you have gardens. And and, farmers, farmers. Yeah, no. yeah, but it's not, they wouldn't want to talk to a farmer. They're basically saying muddy boots because I've gone to inspect my grounds, really. Uh, and then there's the Guardian app where basically you can just meet very left wing people and talk about how you hate Tories and stuff. So there's lots of niche ones which are quite good. Mm. I remember when like the dating apps first came out, like back in the day, uh, I lived in New York at the time and Match.com, I guess, was one of the first ones. And then JDate was really big because I lived in New York and there are a lot of Jewish people there. And JDate was only Jewish people. So if you were Jewish and you only wanted to date Jewish people, then you went on JDate. And, and so on and so forth. I mean, it's, uh, yeah. I've just been sent in something by one of our attendees called Real Dan Meredith. And it's, it's, uh, it's a dictionary definition called Corona Zone. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a verb, engaging in flirty, romantic, and or sexual conversation with someone you have no intention of dating once social distancing is over, solely because self-isolation is leaving you bored and lonely. So I think this is yeah, what's going on. Yeah, that's what I've been doing, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Not you, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Can we look out of your windows? Oh, actually, I have a work because uh, all my stand up gigs were cancelled. So I'm uh, working at the Swedish radio. I'm a host there. And, uh, so I'm, I, I never, I don't have work company. Uh, I never. So for me, it's the opposite. I mean, I, I see people every day. I have to have clothes on. Uh, yeah, it's really strange. What, what is this outside your window? Right now, what's out your window? So this is outside Swedish radio window. Oh, look, it's live from Sweden. Oh, look at that. Oh, that's wow. Cool. Oh, uh, that's Here's my the, window. Oh, that. Nice. What about you, Cavalry? Oh, uh, not so interesting outside my window. Um, oh, you've got secrets outside your window. I'll show you, <laughs> I'll show you what's outside my window. There's, there's an abandoned swimming pool. Yeah, uh, that'll, that'll be good. Society swimming pool. Let's see your dystopian future. And then they, they were halfway through digging up the outside uh, because they wanted to uh, waterproof the building, but they didn't finish that. So I have a pile of mud and stone. <laughs> Excellent. And then there's oh, a swimming pool further up, if you look. That's a beautiful view. Yeah. And then there are these, these, cats. Cats, these cats that my husband oh. is allergic to. Oh, oh my God. It's so they sweet. are allowed inside, but they have a play fence. And yeah, there's a, a naked child. Hi. This is all getting very weird. <laughs> that's, that's my view. Okay. I like the moving. We should do more moving. I've got mine on my computer, so I can't really move it. It's very annoying. Okay. So now I'm back, back in the, the safe zone. <laughs> that's good. See, that was exciting. There's a child. Or is it a ghost? We're not sure. Yeah, the child has followed me now. Yeah. Hello, child. Hello, child. This is Malala. <laughs> so, um, I, I wanted to ask one thing. We have seven minutes. So, in that, I wanted to just get this one thing out that's been promised. How do we okay. look at a certain frame, which looks very tragic and sad, and imagine that I'm born without a sense of humor. Dom, that's the worst nightmare, right? Yeah. How do I look? I've noticed that in your cover. <laughs> So Karin, maybe you can lead the answer and then Radhika can add and Dom can also add. How do that, Dom's going to subtract from that. Subtract, yeah, okay. Dom can subtract. Subtract. But how do you look at a frame and start to see something funny? How do you develop a sense of humor? How do you learn it? Well, you, don't learn, well, you need to know what is humor. And humor mm -hmm. is a mix uh, between recognition and surprise. So it could be things you do or things you say. Um, and you have to, it's, I, I would say it's like a humor code that you have to learn. And usually when I work with people trying to be funny, to get funny, they need to start, what, what do I laugh about? What is it that I laugh about? And then structure it up. And it's, it's okay, I can, I can give you right there, Dom. It's really hard to say in five minutes. Yeah, no, no, I get it. Uh, I just, but, uh, my nightmare is analysis of comedy. I'm not saying you're doing that, but the moment you try and explain what comedy or funny is, uh, it doesn't become funny because it's so subjective. The only thing I know is that I've been working with people that have never joked and that 
almost never laughed and after a while they become funny but it but, takes maybe 10 hours it's not like that but that's a social thing isn't it because i i would contend that there are certain people that are funny certain people that aren't but maybe these people have not been able to certainly if they're swedish or british you know they've been repressed and maybe they've yes, grown up yeah. in, a, in a household where that wasn't it wasn't right or it wasn't proper and, and that's different to frankly some incredibly dull people trying to do stand up and they're just awful and that's <laughs> what i was sort of talking about really it's, it's yeah. often people that think they're funny are the ones that aren't funny actually exactly yeah so Hello. i think <laughs> <laughs> also, I think I'm yeah, friends again. Yeah. I think it's not about them becoming comedians. You know, we don't want. We're not trying to. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, you know, we don't want any more of those bastards. <laughs> even, even people like me, like you said, you know, uh, people with slightly repressed childhoods who didn't know how to laugh. Radhika knew me when I was growing up, and she has been consistently funny always. For me, has, I was. Has Gabri always been very unfunny, Radhika? Or hideously unfunny. Yeah. It's, it was hard being a friend. It's a real problem when she guides you. You're just like, Jesus Christ. Oh, come on. <laughs> Thank you, Dom. There go my sales, huh? There's the yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, I mean, for me, I found it very hard to laugh because I wasn't sure if it was right and also always made the wrong jokes. And, you know, so finally I clamped up and I said, okay, I'm not, I'm not going to be funny anymore. But I learned to see things as funny and not. So I'm not a comedian. I'm not... I'm not good at telling jokes, but I think I'm able to see things as, as funny, even if they're not obviously funny. And I think I learned that. Sounds, that. that sounds almost autistic in a funny way, like almost having to, and I'm being serious, like almost having to learn social cues as to what's funny or not. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, that is a different way of doing it, yeah. Yeah, because I wasn't born that way. I remember myself very young, very repressed and not knowing whether to laugh at a joke or not, and not knowing whether something I'm about to say is funny or not. Yeah, well, hello, welcome to my world. <laughs> <laughs> so can we teach people, Karin? You, you believe strongly that people can be taught, right? They can be converted. Yeah. I've, I've done discovery. it. And yeah, I will teach you. Usually you have different like um, workshop things that you start with to learn how is a joke, what is funny, what is funny is this in this situation? How can I recreate this situation with something completely different and still make it funny for me? Um, so I, I think it's a way of look at life almost, if I should be more philosophical. Um, it's a way of not taking things so seriously, I guess which I did before I went to this standard comedian course. I've never, I, I wasn't funny before. I, I didn't work with humor. I didn't laugh at myself. I did not laugh at the world. I think I thought everything was um, bad, but I found a way to use that um, to laugh. It's, yeah. Mm -hmm. And to see you know, I, it, it, the thing I've noticed because I never taught stand up or joke writing, but I did uh, end up uh, teaching a lot of improv, improvised comedy. Because in improvised comedy, the difference I think is that there are rules so that you don't fuck a scene up. You know, like it's like don't kill your scene partner because then you don't have one. So, like, it's a simple always rule. Always say yes. Say that again. Always say yes. Yeah, always say yes, you know, like build on the data. So those types of rules and then you just basically you're a facilitator more than a teacher and you just get people through uh, the format, you know. So I, I did find an interesting thing happening in improv where a lot of people uh, who had a lot of, you know, anxiety about being up on stage in front of other people, you know. So it was like a lot of public speaking horror and things like that. It, it, the thing about improv that was nice was that you're not intentionally trying to be funny. And that was something that you always tell the students, like, look, just don't worry about being funny. That's not what we're here for. And then the format of improv and just saying yes to what someone else has said and not knowing what's going to come next sometimes lends itself to just naturally coming up with funny situations. So I do think that that is very different from teaching stand-up, which, is, which is very different. It's written and it's structured. It's structured. And I do believe that most people who do show up to a stand-up class, I mean, Karen may be a rare exception, and I don't know how it is that you ended up going to a class, because I just feel like a lot of people who go to those classes do think they are funny, like what Dom said, is that they do think they have a chance. You know what I'm They've saying? They've been told, oh, you're a bit of They've a They've been cop. told that. 
Yeah. <laughs> no, no. So, I'm, I'm curious to know, actually, Karen, what it was that drove you to go to the class. Oh, it was, I had my kids. Yeah, it was just a coincidence. My kids were really small. I wanted to uh, go away from my family for a week. And I was going to this paint course, but there was no. So I ended up in this. I didn't know what it was. But actually, the humor I teach is it's mostly not for stand-up comedians. It's ah. for people having trying to have more fun. Okay. And to, yeah. And that's what we need. That's what we need now. We so need Karen, laughter yoga. We need mental laughter yoga, which is what Karen's teaching, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, maybe, yeah. It's the endorphin so, thing. You a way of releasing happiness, uh, of making, of almost forcing yourself into changing. I mean, it's a bit like you said you went. Oh, to yeah, stand yeah. Up. You, went, yeah. you went to stand up because you were having depression, and I think it is yeah. part of that is about trying to teach your motor neurons to to think in a different way. Like you're, you're. I'm getting a bit. bit Cycle. My daughter's doing neuroscience, so she's filling me with all this stuff. But it is about forcing your brain to be more positive. I'm yes. naturally negative. I love it. And I kind of wallow in it. And you need me to be forced to go in the other way, I think. Completely. Yeah, me too. In my first stand-up set, I, I came to stand-up really late because I did so much improv and acting and things before that. But my first stand-up set, I remember, was all about the tragedy of not having, uh, of not having kids. Like, that's actually what drove me. I mean, I don't think it was a tragedy, but it did feel like one from the community that I come from. But it was all about that harrowing journey of deciding I didn't want to have children and everyone's opinions and how difficult that was and how it was depressing. And, blah, blah, blah. and that all is what led me to start all, you know, getting into the writing of comedy. And since then, that's been a very small part of it. But I just find that every time something bad happens in my life, or I recognize something shit's going down. I just have to wait fucking six months before I have a set. But that's what comedy is. Comedy is a way, it's, it's a sort of safe way of, 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 of letting out really dark things often. And, and, and that's why it's, it's quite so relevant right now because everyone's so anxious, you know, except for Karen, who's had it, so she's totally relaxed. But uh, everyone's really relaxed about the, uh, uh, everyone's very nervous about it and anxious and you're at home and you've got all this stuff. And comedy is a way of releasing that in a kind of slightly safe way, I think. Yeah, yes. If you, can, if you if you were happy, content, I mean, uh, uh, there's no humor in that. There's no humor in being positive. No. The humor is True. in being negative. I mean, we're all gonna die. Just just laugh. What? Unless you're Ellen DeGeneres, in that case. <laughs> oh, I didn't tell you. Yeah, yeah. I... <laughs> oh, look. Hello. What's that? Oh, look. I've been cooked a really fine English breakfast by my children. Oh, lovely. Oh, wow. Uh, they're, they're, it's one of the things that's really special is them oh. learning stuff like that. <laughs> what the fuck is that? It feels like they've hacked something in half. <laughs> it looks like what they did. Come here. Come here. Come here, my dog. This is happening. Whoops. Come here. Did your dog cook Say that? Say hello to everyone. <laughs> Say hello. This is my dog, Fitzgerald. There we go. No, you just want the toast anyway. Sorry, it's disintegrating now. Did the dog bring the toast? Oh, I have a radio show to make here. Uh, okay, so yeah, we are over time, but thank you so much for all being here today and sharing. So if people fun. want to reach out to you, um, Karin, to get uh, training, um, can I put them on? Email ID? or yeah, yeah. Come, come on over. I, can I, don't make it anyone, I don't want anyone contacting me. Go away. <laughs> It's already just for me, it's so nice to talk to people that aren't my family. Like, just to see people that aren't my family, it's really nice. I just started, I just, because of this uh, event, I, I followed, uh, I wanted to tag, like, Dom and Karen on Instagram, and I did. And, and I, I think I may have uh, followed both of you, like, just a few days ago. And then this morning or the other, yeah, something maybe yesterday or whatever, I woke up and... There was this photograph. Yeah, there was a really sad looking guy photograph on Dom's page and I was just laughing, thinking. That's just me again. It's on brand. It's very on brand. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. And Radhika, you are also training corporates and sharing, um, um, I mean, uh, having comedy for corporates and so they can reach out to you in case that's required, right? Yeah, absolutely. I'm just, I, 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 I it do a lot of, I, I still do some improv courses in that way, but I mean, I know how that would work online, but yeah, performing, we're all, we're all still trying to do that. And Dom, what, what does one get from you? I mean, apart from a sad song playlist. Uh, I'm doing these things called the Corona Diaries on uh, my Instagram story, 
which is basically, oh. if you want to see me arguing with my family every day, um, that's available. Uh, oh, that's and then I've got, I've got a podcast coming out called Earworm, uh, where I ring people around the world who don't know that I'm ringing them. And uh, I have my favorite band's um, Baby Bird soundtrack. Oh, your diary. Is that on Facebook, yeah. your diary? Yeah. No, my, uh, my Corona diaries are on Instagram, which is real Dom Jolly, because Excellent. obviously there are a lot of fakes. All right. That's great. Thank you all so much. We are five minutes over time and I'm conscious only because of Karin's uh, um, radio uh, show coming up. Yeah, because really and... deep dry, I'm not busy at all. We're just sitting here. <laughs> and for the audience, before we sign out, just want to share that we're going to be doing vicarious travel starting next week. So April 25th is our first show where you're going to travel with my company Culture Rings uh, through the, the actual travelers, our clients who have gone to remote places. So Christine Gibbons Nigida is gonna take us to Gujarat. So you are a very, very good guide, Kabri, I have to say. I yes. really love my day in Bangalore, it's amazing. It was oh, great. Thank you, really recommend. Thank you. Thanks guys, thank you for having us. Thank you, and Corona. Thank you very much, guys. Great, goodbye. <laughs> Bye. See how cultural we are. See you guys. Bye, guys. My first leave meeting? Yes.